I'm so happy to be here today. I have a special guest that's going to join me. And uh, in just a moment, we will greet her. But before we bring her on screen, I'd you know, love for you to sign in. It's always so great to see all you people here. Aloha, Judy Warren, lovely to have you here. And Marjorie Hirschberger, you are in snowy Lancaster, PA, beautiful part of our country, just gorgeous, home of many Amish communities, so lovely. And Marjorie, I think I have one of your small town charms in today's program, you'll have to stay tuned. And Retha up there in cold Wyoming, Wyoming, and I'm glad to hear that you're getting better from COVID. Definitely want to hear, you know, people recovering from COVID, right? Getting that behind them. Um, but you know, we're pretty chilly here today too in Texas. In fact, uh, we've had some terrible, you know, road traffic situations and so forth. But we're safe and sound here in the studio. So my guest today is Joanne Banco, and Joanne and I go back many years, many, many years, over 15 years. And this uh, image of us is on the set of It's So Easy back in 2016. But do you know, um, a year ago when, when we published our last issue of the magazine, Joanne was always a frequent contributor to Dime. And so I received this stitched um, greeting card from Joanne. So this is all embroidered on felt, and then she applied the felt to cardstock and then wrote me a really precious note, which I'm going to share with you because I think it's lovely for you to know just how sweet of a woman Joanne Banco really is. So we'll go ahead and we'll bring that up. And basically she said that she wanted to, uh, let me know how much she appreciated working with Dime all these years. And her first article was 2007. I can't believe how long ago that was. And of course, she still has that first project. How fun. And she said it was truly a privilege to work, to be in the company of artists like myself, along with many talented writers that we had as contributors over the years. And she says she'll miss the magazine, just as I will but that we really set the standard for quality education in machine embroidery. And that was so sweet, so touching for me to receive that letter. So I just thought you would maybe enjoy hearing that too. So I think I'll bring in Joanne and let her say hello. Hi, Joanne, how are hello. you? I'm good, but you have me all, you have me all I, sentimental now. I know, you, I know. you surprised me with that. And now yeah. I'm like, oh. I know. Well, you know, I think sometimes when we take the effort to do a kindness like that, to put something in writing and send it off, we often forget, you know, the effect that it had on the yeah. recipient. Or, or maybe at that, you know, they'll call and say, thank you so much. But months later, those memories linger, you know, and that's yeah, how that's I right. always think of you, the kindness that you showed me. So well, right? I'm I'm so glad that that the the note meant something to you because you know it meant a lot to me to to be able to work with you Absolutely. And, and and know each other all these years. So but it really shows you how you're right. When we do something, you know, that little extra stitched gift yeah. and send it off to somebody, um, uh, you know, something like that. In all likelihood, it's probably going to be kept and cherished in that little treasure box. So I know. And, you know, I know many of our viewers uh, uh, make gifts with their embroidery machines, right? Absolutely. It's one of the number one things that we do, all of us, yeah. do, you yeah. know. We have an opportunity coming up to gift something to someone and, oh, you know, hunker down in our sewing room and dream up some great project project that we want to do. So maybe folks, you would tell us that, um, you know, what are you a gift maker on your embroidery machine? Is that one of your number one things to do? We'd love to hear that. You can uh, give us a thumbs up or a smiley face, something like that. So, and, you know, you can make a greeting card um, faster than you could go to the go to the store to buy it. <laughs> You really oh yeah, um, my little method there with with the felt. Yeah. I use the real stiff yeah. felt. Mm -hmm. The the you know they're actually stiffened sheets. Right. Don't right. get the ones with adhesive on the back. You want just the yeah. plain stiff sheets. Yeah, so and I a lot of times I do it in my um, dime magnetic hoop because it hoops really well in that. And yeah. then I stitch out almost any design you want to. You could put on that felt, and then yeah. I cut it to size. And then I like to actually stitch it to the card. Mm -hmm. Rather, some, if I'm in a big hurry, I'll, yeah. I'll glue it on sure. with, you know, little glue dots. But usually yeah. I actually stitch through it because that, you know, when people see the inside and they see those stitches, you right. know, and that uh, that method also allows you to do it without having any of the raw edges on the back. So 
right. which is kind of a fun way to do it. I've been making it's those adorable. for a long time. It's just beautiful and very yeah. touching. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. But, you know, you have graced the pages of Dimes uh, magazine for many years. And your projects, we were always so tickled <laughs> when your box would arrive. What is inside? You know, you never disappointed us. Never disappointed. Well, it was always a challenge because you had some phenomenal people, including yourself, oh. you know, that I had to kind of keep match up to. So yeah. um, we grow from things like that, though, don't we? That's, right. you know, that's part of the joy of embroidering and and creating things is that we see something and we aspire to that next level. So I, I, I agree. And, you know, it, it does kind of raise the bar. Right. Yes. You know, yes. I mean. When I first started the magazine in 1998, I, our theme here was we have to move away from plop and drop. And, you know, that meant just that's yes. what style was. Just any old teddy bear, kitty cat, you know, dropped or plopped. Right or there. Or maybe start. over there if you knew how yeah. to put it there. <laughs> maybe crooked, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, yeah, and we sure have moved on from that. So Definitely. that's good. So many people are saying, lovely to see you today, Lottie Conrad. Uh -huh. so, so, so glad to see both of us. And uh, Cheryl Sample, has she has friends. Oh, her friends have come to it, expect an embroidered gift. Uh -huh. Well, that is yes. too, right? Yes, I've experienced that in my own yeah. family. Yep, yep. Aww. That the room goes silent when your box gets open and they're like, yeah. You know, the, again, the bar is set pretty high because they they're expecting something really personalized. But that's, that's right. again, it's the beauty of being able to stitch things yourselves. Yeah. So, do it. I know you have some really cool things in store for us today. I do. I hope to inspire our our um, friends here today and um, give them some ideas and some tips and tricks too. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and let you get started? Of course, today's program is brought to you by Sticky Hoop. Uh -huh. And after we let Joanne show her fabulous tips, I'm going to show you the new sizes that are now available in Sticky Hoop. And they include a new brother size, which means a new uh, machine compatibility, and also uh, Bernina, Janome, Viking, and Foff. So stay tuned. Nice. You can never have too many hoops or too many hooping aids, hooping helpers. That's right. Okay, so take it away, Joanne. Well, you had that wonderful picture of the two of us in the It's So Easy TV studio, and uh, I have spent lots of time there. I know you've spent lots of time there as well. I happen to live only about 40 minutes uh, from the studio. So for me, it was always, you know, really easy to pack up you know, all my stuff. I didn't have to pack in suitcases like you did and fly over. But, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of good, a lot of good memories there. And they have done a lot to promote the, uh, the, the craft of sewing in so many different ways, whether it's machine embroidery, you know, or many, many, many other things. So um, hopefully, um, you know, like I said, these tips from the TV show will help you learn to plan, prep and stitch perfectly placed embroidery. But I think that um, for some of our people here, some, some of our friends may not even be familiar with It's So Easy TV. You know, it's, it's certainly possible. Uh, it's broadcast nationwide, but I realize there are some, some markets where it may not be um, on. So if you have the opportunity to watch it on PBS, that's where you will find it. So check your PBS um, channels. Uh, it comes through Create TV. So if you have Create TV, you know, check your your stations for that. You can also watch the show online at it's so easy tv.com. That's the official it's so easy TV website. And what they do is they don't show what's currently airing on PBS. PBS gets first dibs with the newest season, but they will show the season that was just previously aired. And that uh, every Friday at noon on the, on the website, a new show is posted. And so we're going through, series uh, 2000, I believe right now, um, you lose track sometimes, but so you can, you can go there. Like I said, every Friday at noon, Eastern standard time, uh, a new show comes out and, um, and then, you know, you can see the whole series if you catch it um, online, you can watch it as well. I have my own YouTube channel. If you let's go. sew with Joanne Banco is where you'll find me on YouTube. And I post my particular segments on there, but uh, you can also go to 
the YouTube channel that is specific for the TV show. Now it's not it's so easy. It's KS Productions TV is what you would look for in YouTube. And you're going to find a massive amount of their videos that they've done. So um, from other shows as well, because they um, KS Productions produces uh, quite a few uh, craft and creative TV shows. So behind the scenes is always fun to see, isn't it? I mean, when, when you, you know, you see the pretty pictures when everything's done, but you don't see what goes on to, to make that happen. So the first thing is always makeup, right? That's the first you get there, you plop all your stuff down and, and you head right for the makeup chair. And uh, I think that for me, that was always a little bit of a, of a, of a shock at first, uh, the first few times, because you're not used to having um, so much makeup put on but you never notice it when you're on set because it is so bright in there. Uh, and the opposite side of that picture is what we call the green room. And uh, that's where everybody preps. So it, it is literally like just a, a, a massive amount of activity in there when there are a lot of uh, instructors there taping. You each get your own table and right. you each get your own tray. They, they, they use oversized baking trays and right, like commercial grade cookie sheets. Exactly. Giant. They're really sturdy. They're stainless steel. They're really sturdy, which is important because goodness knows what we're loading on them, right? Yep. And you spread everything out. You, it gives you a chance to organize. Usually we get there a day before, right? To set yes. up. So right. And uh, Joanne, Jane O'Malley says, do you have to bring your own sewing machines? No, everything is on set. Which is no. wonderful. Great it's sponsored Hi, Jan. by Brother. It's sponsored by Brother. And you are yes. a Brother Ambassador. So. I am a Brother Ambassador. Yes. That is correct. And so Brother does. So machines are Brother. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So for me, that's, you know, always a bonus as well, because I already know how to use them. But I've been known to sneak in the studio and, you know, while somebody's setting up and help them too, because we, oh. not, not every guest there is familiar with the machines, but uh, right. they do tend to fall in love with them pretty quick once they start that's, sewing on those Brother that, Right. And, those and usually machines. it's the top of the line that's on the studio floor. So some of the guests don't have that same machine at home. And so, yeah, Joanne is the absolute machine wizard, making sure everybody's, you know, up to speed on the features that they're showcasing. Well, it's always fun, too, to pull out some of the different accessory feet. You know, once that you find out what somebody's going to show on the show and then you pull out an accessory foot and say, hey, this is going to make your job a whole lot easier. Give me a minute to show you how to use it. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And our friend uh, Connie Beeler said that she's learned so much from It's So Easy uh, on, on TV and she loves the instructions that are given on the computer and can be printed. Free designs come, come up as well. Awesome, awesome site. So yes, a great endorsement for sure. Thanks, Connie. And, you know, Connie made a really good point because on the It's So Easy TV website, um, and on my website, and I link to that through my YouTube channels, um, the instructions are are there that coordinate with all of the shows. Mm -hmm. So everything I'm going to show you today, you're going to be able to find, you know, some tips or, or, or full-fledged instructions for. So yeah. um, I know a lot of us, we learn differently. Some of us like to watch. Some of us like to read. Some of, you know, like to do. I think, you know, some of us like to do all of that all combined together in order to really get it, you know, right. sealed in, in your mind. So, you know, there's there's um, always a lot of people behind the scenes, literally um, helping and doing things to make make the show go smoothly. So you see some of the ladies in the office and then in that kind of dark picture, that's actually the control room. So in that picture, you see uh, Kathy Stull, who is the producer of It's So Easy and many other shows and uh, Mike Murphy, who is the director. So they're in that little kind of, I think it's a soundproof room where everything, all the controls are and they're literally um, running the show from that, from that little, little corner. And then cameramen, right? We, you know, the cameramen are are your <laughs> your best friend there um, because they're going to take all the angles. You just go ahead and teach that as if you're teaching a class, and they'll catch all of the images exactly at the right time, zooming in so that all the viewers can see exactly what uh, what they need to see in order for you know for them to be able to repeat those those you steps. Know, and Joanne, as a guest, you know, you kind of walk in, right, and you see these burly men, you know, usually sitting in a chair reading a book, you know, waiting. There's a lot of waiting. A lot of waiting. Yes. Tons right. of waiting. So they'll be sitting, you know, kind of near their camera, but maybe not right at the camera, reading and so forth. And then 
when it's time, you know, that like as a guest, you walk on set, you have everything prepped and, and you, now you're on set behind the machine and those gentlemen are, and well, in this case, they're all men, they rise and get behind the camera. And you kind of look at them like, oh, you know, like what do they know about embroidery? But boy, do they know their stuff. And oh my, goes, you're right. Well, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to direct or kind of, you know, lift the fabric so that you get a better view. They know exactly what they're going for. It's very cool. That, that is true. So we've got sound guys there. We got camera guys there. We've got um, assistant producer, um, you know, just a whole, whole lot of people again that make that make that happen. Right. And I, I have to say, you know, I've, I've, I haven't had experience at any other TV studio, but I have heard stories and it's always been said that everybody leaves it so easy feeling better than they came in because they treat you so well <laughs> well, and, <I'm> sure. <laughs> and everything is so you're so comfortable there that really helps you you know do yeah. what you need to do when, when well i have done a lot of tv on different <laughs> sets like i've done hd tv and, and of course tons with sewing with nancy and it is very different and it's so easy um you know you have an earpiece in your ear yes right? and, yes sometimes and, you'll see it peeking yeah. out Right. And so usually Kathy Stahl, the producer, you know, she's talking to you as while you're taping. And, you know, that can really throw people if you've never experienced that and you're just doing your thing, you're in your zone. And then they say 30 seconds, you know, uh -huh. you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you uh, the true story. My very first time there, naturally, I was a little bit, you know, Sure. You know, and, and I, I, I like to joke that in my family, we didn't even do home movies. So I wasn't used to being on camera. So it was going to be a really new thing for me. But I had taught for many years, you know, live classes. I still teach a local a local group um, in my city that uh, that I've been teaching for over 25 years. Once a month, I do two classes and see a lot of the same people. But, you know, it was different. So I was talking to my husband the night before and he said, just look at that camera like they're everybody that you're used to seeing sitting in front of you in a class. So right. I took that to heart. And, you know, right. when I went, um, that, that really helped, but, it, but I did have a slight glitch. Somebody was supposed to plug something in and they didn't do it. And when I started talking, uh, I thought everything was fine. And then I got that little yell in the ear, stop, 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 stop. And I thought, what did I do? I thought it felt like everything was going good. And yeah. it was simply because somebody hadn't plugged something in. So they had to right. they had to fix that glitch. And then yeah. of course you have to start over again. But well, we have a couple of questions. So Arnell wants to know, do you have bloopers? You know, that's really a, a great question. Um, I think they delete the bloopers immediately because we do get bloopers occasionally, but um, they don't store them at all. And I have to say for me personally, there have been very few. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, you, you get in a, in a flow and, you know, that show is taped where they really want you to be natural. It's, I think right. a lot of our viewers would agree that it's, it, you feel like you're in the sewing room with that person, mm -hmm. you know? Um, I agree. so they, they don't even really want you to be too, per too perfect. They right. want and you to. Yeah. Just like someone else would experience in their own sewing room. So Jan O'Malley says, do you get to retake any steps or is it live? So to speak. If something really bad happens, like you break a needle, at, you know, obviously they're going to stop. Or if you felt like you needed to, to correct something, you can say, oh, I'm sorry. And then they'll stop and then you'll you'll pick it back up. The editor there, her name is Sherry. She her picture wasn't in any of those. She is absolutely awesome because she makes everybody look perfect at the, at the end. But yeah, Amazing. sometimes they do have to stop it. it yeah. You know, it, it depends on the person. But those are right. all good questions. They are great questions, you know, and you, you, well, they own the footage, so we don't really get the, the raw footage, you know, so. And right. then Becky Munns wants to know, are you uh, filming during COVID? We did, we did film, um, I'm trying to remember if there was two times during, during COVID. And mm -hmm. of course, everybody wore a mask, um, unless you were on set and you were, we were all distanced. And in fact, in the most recent taping um, that's coming up uh, in March, it'll be uh, premiering on, on PBS. Um, uh, Angela Wolf, who is the anchor of the show, we don't really have a host because everybody hosts their own show once they're on there, but she is the anchor of the show. She did her, her taping from her home studio for the first time ever. 
um, there were travel restrictions and um, sure. it was just, you know, it was, so you'll see a little bit, of, you'll see a little bit of something different this time around with yeah. that. And then sure, Johnson, you wanted to know, can you watch today's broadcast later? And you sure can. This will always be on uh, Designs and Machine Embroidery's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So you can watch it um, and the rebroadcast re at any time. Okay. Yeah. So I thought I, you know, I just um, took some some pictures that were from projects that were done during the show. And I thought we'd kind of talk a little bit about what I consider the three P's of embroidery that, that really um, make a difference in, in your projects. And that's planning, prepping, and placement. So borders have always been one of my favorite, favorite things to do. Um, I just, you know, it's it, to, to connect designs and be able to make a large design out of connected designs, whether you're using it as a hem treatment like I did here, or you'll see in, in some of the other areas. So, you know, for, for, for a lot of us, um, when we're first embroidering, what do we do? We do the plop and drop, right? You do one thing in one spot, you hold your breath and you're happy with, <laughs> with the result, but we start to grow and we want to expand and we want to create things that have more embroidery. So what, what do we call that? We call that continuous embroidery, right? And a border is a, is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite tools are templates. Eileen, you are, I have to say, the ultimate queen of templates. Um, <laughs> you, were using, you were using templates before anybody even imagined that we needed them, That's really right. and truly. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, you've Definitely. continued, you know, to provide the products that we need to make templates. Uh, you could print them just from ordinary computer paper, but, you know, the print and stick target paper is my absolute favorite because it has you know, you put it through your printer, just like a regular piece of paper, and you peel off that protective sheet. And the back of your template now is just slightly tacky. So everything is held in place while you're doing your embroidery and you don't need to tape. Uh, you know, for many years, you'll see some of my things here. You know, I ran out of print and stick and I had to resort to taping again. But sure. um, when you have that print and stick paper, yeah, stock it's up on it, keep it in your, mm -hmm. keep it right by your printer so you have it handy. Yeah. And um you know, the other thing you need for templates, though, is what? Software, right? And, you know, for, for years, I would always try to find ways to teach people how to embroider, how to do all this, you know, accurate placement without templates, which there are ways to do it, but it's tedious and time consuming. But it was because so many people didn't have computer knowledge or didn't have access to computers in the early days. And now, boy, that's a whole different story. So if you have a computer, there is no excuse not to have software because Dime is providing it for you. <laughs> so, you know, if you've got software from your sewing machine manufacturer, that's great. I use my PE design software. I use other software, but I recommend the, the uh, tool shed um, for people that are, want to get started or, you know, just want to have a little, a little, a little taste of software and you can turn print templates with that. So absolutely. So handy. Well, you know, before we get going on that last image that you showed, you had the, uh, the show number, which was show 1605. So, um, Retha said, you know, how do I know if our PBS station shows it so easy? Jane O'Malley says that her PBS station stopped airing it. Uh, and so, but they can go online, right? They don't have to watch it on PBS. So maybe, Correct. Maybe. Although you won't see, you won't see all the shows online. I okay. post my shows on my website or on my YouTube channel. Um, so you can watch all the segments that I taped. Okay. You can watch a lot of the other segments on the uh, KS Productions YouTube site. But if you really want, you know, the whole series and you don't get it on your PBS, you can also order DVDs and in some cases USBs with the entire series, they have, they sell whole collections on it's so easy tv.com. So you can purchase them and it's, you know, it's a great thing to have cause you're going to be able to watch it at your own pace over and over again. Um, you know, just, just pop it into a CD drive and you're good. You're good to go. They have started doing some of them on USB now as well. Okay. So ho hopefully that helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? Um, call up your PBS station and tell them you want, you want to see it. Tell them you want to see sewing television. I know in my area, um, uh, I believe Nancy's show is still still running. 
Oh, absolutely. And, yes. and it, it shows just before it's so easy on, on, yeah. uh, on Sunday. So, right. you know, a lot of times you do have to ask, you have to tell them, you know, when they know people are interested, yes. um, then they can do that. That's right. So, mm -hmm. and yeah, so I did reference each of the shows on here so that if you want to go later and search for that on my site or on the It's So Easy TV site, um, you'll be able to do that. And then you'll find the instructions that coordinate with it. So okay. great. Hope that okay. helps. Okay. We only have so much time here, right? I know, right? <laughs> okay, so there, there's just an example. Like I said, I didn't have the sticky with me that day, so I just um, taped it in place. But um, once you've positioned that, you're you're ready to to stitch, you know, all kinds of things. Um, I like to look beyond borders as edges and think about other places where you're you're not you're not really considering it a border, but you're stitching it as if it was a border by linking those designs, connecting it, you know, stitching one at a time or however many will fit in the hoop at a time and then repositioning the template and, you know, getting getting your placement down for the next grouping of, of designs. So whether it's a ready-made dress like the coral one on the left or a dress that I constructed from scratch featured on uh, it's so easy, but an originally uh, designed for dime for the magazine. Um, you can stitch those on princess lines are like the perfect, perfect place to take advantage of interlocking, matching, linking border designs. And then I like to do, you know, whatever I can to tie a color scheme together. So you can see with this one, um, I'll tell you just a little bit about how I prepped it. Uh, that knit, for that blue dress was a rayon knit. It was rather soft and those designs aren't really heavy, but they're not really light. So we could do another whole show on matching, matching designs to fabric, right? Yes. But I needed to beef that up a little bit. So my prep for that was to use a lightweight fusible Trico interfacing. And I backed that whole panel. I like to cut my pieces oversized when I'm gonna do embroidery on a garment from scratch and then back the whole piece uh, very often with uh, interfacing. I still add stabilizer, so I used a, a cutaway mesh on that behind each motif. But then once I put it in the hoop, it's going to hold nice and tight, and it's just going to beef up that fabric and give it um, a good chance for having good results. I do test, though. I have to tell you, that's probably my number one tip is to always test your design on your fabric. It's always best to test is what I like to say. And you're going to be able to see if that's all compatible uh, before you start. So, and you can see trust out color combinations as well. We used to say there's two types of embroiderers: those who test and those who those wish. Those who have. wish they would have absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and so I think we answered Candy Bray's question. She said, "Do you do those on uh, embroidery on the pieces before you create the garment?" So just want to yep. make sure. Yep, that's what she's showing right there, Candy. Uh -huh. A lot of times what I'll put in my instruction is cut one oversized piece, dot, 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 or to fill your hoop. Because it depends on what hoop you're using as well. Now there I just used a standard regular hoop. Um, I have the grid in there because, you know, those grids um, that come with the hoops or can be, you know, purchased separately are really your key to uh, alignment. Again, no matter what, no matter what, toots and whistles you have built into your machine, uh, that will always give you, um, especially a good start, you know, and then the ability to, to link those as well. So there's another just little picture of, of the, the process and the progress, um, tying again that color scheme together with just a, uh, I just bought some, some lightweight knit and uh, I buy the fabric first and then choose my thread colors because it's to do it the other way around. I know you know what I mean. I remember I you, did. Did a, you did a whole article on that one time. I sure and did. That's uh, such a good point, but it's the kind of thing you might not think of until right. it's too late. So Right. I went to find beaded trim and boy, did I wind up spending a fortune because of this unique color combination I had embroidered on a linen yeah. dress and blah. Anyway. It's much easier to match the thread to the fabric than the fabric to the thread. That's right. So borders again, um, I'm a border, <laughs> I'm a border person. I love doing borders. Uh, you know, borders are a great place to start, Joanne, on a garment. Absolutely. You know, and linear um, graphic dimension is very uh, flattering on most figures. 
So if you're new to embellishing on garments, you know, go with borders because you yeah. really can't go wrong. Yeah, it, it is. It's, and it's a very upscale look too. And when they're linked perfectly, trust me, your embroidery friends are going to come up and they're going to be like turning it and seeing like, how did you do that? How did you do that? They're going to want to know how to do the same, how to do the same thing. So, you know, the, the one on the right is uh, actually a picture from um, my book. And I just kind of wanted to show that, you know, you, you don't always have to do the whole, you know, thing where you're making something a little bit more detailed. You could just take a, a simple wrap and just add designs to it and have a, have a great, a great look. So I uh, just added just a simple, simple border with that. So there again, you know, I'm, I've got templates, but now this is where we start to think about, you know, and this is where it's important to learn all of the special features of, of your machine. And there's so many, you know, when you buy a machine from a, from a dealer, many of them offer free lessons. Um, there's a lot of things online these days. And, you know, you, you need to learn what all of those tools are that you have and then make the use, make, make the best use of those tools in your toolbox, toolbox, uh, whether you have a projector, whether you have a camera, whatever it is, even if I still like to start with templates, I think Eileen, aren't you kind of like that too? Like you just like oh. that template is your yeah. It's your go-to, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I use I use cameras and scanner. I use all kinds of stuff, but if that printed template auditioned right on the garment is the only way really to tell what it's going to look like. And if it's yeah. for me, I, you know, I I love the print and stick because I can stick it on the garment, put the garment on and stand in front of the mirror and see, is this in the right position? Is the sides correct? That kind of thing. Well, you know, I remember another article you did that that I, I found so instructive and that was where you were talked about auditioning, but you talked about um, doing it maybe on a dress form mm -hmm. and then taking a picture Yes, and then, you know, thinking about it for a little right. while. And it's, it's amazing what kind of difference that makes because you can try things in different areas. I mean, a lot of what you're seeing so far are, you know, symmetrical yes. things, but asymmetrical is great too but you don't know exactly where you want to put it until right. you until you audition it so and anything around a collar you know when it's on the dress form or when it's on a hanger or flat you know you, you don't always get uh where, what the collar is going to cover and, exactly you know, we're all really um about achieving perfect placement and aligning things near its seam lines and shoulders and blah, blah, blah. And then when you put it after all that embroidery and you put it on and the jacket the collar flaps open and you've hidden half of it. It's very yep. frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. And then I don't know that we want to really answer this. Arnell Burroughs says, how many years have you been embroidering? Me That's personally? Right up there with how old are you? <laughs> uh, you know, I bought the very first embroidery machine that came out. I did too. In the mm -hmm. 80s. And we had the same one. I know that with it. You know, yeah. it's another lifetime, another story. But so um, since the 80s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was hooked immediately. Um, I, just real quick. I, I actually I was working in a store um, selling machines that did not do embroidery. And I started getting customers coming in and talking about the shop down the road <laughs> that had this machine that did all these things and uh, famous last words. I can remember sincerely asking one lady, you know, so like, what do you do with all of it? Cause we just, we, it's a, it's what, you know, when you don't know what you don't have, you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And, and she was like, well, you just do it however you want. So naturally within a few days I went down and uh, checked that out and uh, eventually, eventually bought one. And I never had trouble no, being, finding ways, ways to use it in places. I <laughs> places know. That that embroidery. Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, there I just, you know, again, I've used a template, but what I did is I took up the, brought up the camera and used that to just, you know, to, to pinpoint exactly like, is my template, you know, where I need it and is my stitch going to start where I want it. So that kind of brings me to the next screen because Again, I realize we've got lots of different people, lots of our friends here today have different machines, you know, different capabilities. There's different price points. Today, there's a machine for everybody in every budget, which is a wonderful thing. Because again, back when we bought our first ones, that was it. You had one choice and it was a top of the line machine and it was pretty pricey and, you know, you were fortunate to be able to get it, but there weren't any other options. Today, 
the sky's the limit and there really is something for for everybody and we've got tools like the trial key a trial key comes to my rescue comes to anybody's rescue because it's the easiest way for you again to pinpoint the the placement because those little keys there um that you see at the at the top edge those show you where the top of the design is the bottom of the design is the right the left the corner so if you're um you know pointing to that from the very first stitch where it's going to start or the top of your design it's going to show you exactly where that is and and then you've got the moving keys that you can nudge it so right. even if your template isn't perfectly placed or wiggled a little bit you know i think the the main thing we need to really get used to is putting things in the hoop on the straight and narrow <laughs> you know to to put it bluntly you just you want things to be parallel and perpendicular to your hoop um, once you get that fabric in there like that if you need to you know move it jog it a little bit jogging keys is another way to to, to describe that up down right left um, right. these keys so yeah. you're going to find this built into most every machine out there yeah and other terms that you could use is navigation keys jog keys like you mentioned um, yeah you refer to the trial key, but I call that the trace feature, which it's the same. Yeah, same thing. You know, do the perimeter. So yeah, uh, whatever language your machine uh, uses, you know, it's the same feature. And if if you're in the market for a machine, these are really key features to explore on a new machine when you go into test drive. You want to be comfortable using those navigation, trace feature, trial key, you know, so as long as when you sit down during your test drive and things become intuitive, you know, you're on the right machine. Yeah, you're so right. And, you know, thinking about that, you know, there may be people that are here right now that don't have um, that capability. Well, you never know what you're going to what you're going to do in the future. So, you know, don't ever say, oh, I don't have that. So I don't want to learn about it or I don't want right. to see it or I don't need to know it. The yeah. more you know, the more educated you are, the better decision you're going to make when it does come time for you to, you know, to pick and choose. So yeah. it's always it's always good to know what the options are. Right. Definitely. Our friend Lottie Conrad says she calls it going around the block. I like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's yeah. uh it's it's really a great feature. It's really yeah. something that just uh like I said, it comes to your rescue because you can see right. exactly where things are gonna go um yeah. you know each and every time. So and Betty Simpson said that she uh fifteen years ago she taught freehand embroidery and then in two thousand three brought the first you know, brother Disney machine and now she's moved on up to the stellar and teaches one on one. So Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, if you're investing in a machine, don't think it's the end of your sewing and embroidery journey. Frankly, it's just the beginning. <laughs> that is so true. That yeah. is so true. And you know, the, you, your skills build. So the next time, you know, yeah. you're going to have more more options and more opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's kind of a a, a little bit of a a, a, a a side note, but a lot of people tend to get a little bit overwhelmed when they do have a lot of options or they think I'll never use all that. Well, you know what? Mm -hmm. I bet you and I don't use everything we have, but we sure have fun using what we do use, right? <laughs> right, for sure. But you know, I also think buying a machine and not that we're selling machines, but you know, it is a reality of this hobby. Um, it's kind of like buying a house. You know, you don't buy for today's needs. You buy exactly. for your needs in like five years. So if your family is growing, you know, do that. Yeah. And then Cindy Ball wants to know if you will be her neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to be your neighbor, Cindy. <laughs> yeah. I don't and know then, anybody on my street that sews. So <laughs> Oh, me neither. Me neither. Well, actually, that's not true. Now there are now I have two neighbors who sew. A young oh. girl that was piecing by hand. Wow. She's a high schooler and she got into cosplay. And I just happened to talk to her mother and I'm like, piecing by hand i'm like oh stay stand here and i brought a machine i gave her a machine yeah like, just yeah. do this and then oh this girl now is like making she could do broadway costumes i mean oh she's what a yeah. great thing that is I so know. wonderful right. but hey let's take care of victoria bartle she wants to know what do you use for marking fabric oh. like, i guess if you're not using a template right because templates don't right. mark fabric they just adhere to your fabric if you use our print and stick target template paper it will adhere temporarily or if you use copy paper you'll tape it in place so 
I also use um, uh, the target marker. So you're actually going to see that in in one of the next pictures, um, the dime target markers. Um, those are little little stickers that have uh, arrows on there showing, you know, the exact center of your design. So it's it's an easy way to mark your center placement and not have to use chalk or a wash away marker. I do use chalk at times, you know, to maybe draw my my mm -hmm. my continuous straight line where I want to you know, anchor that design to start with. Um, and I use wash away markers, but I try whenever possible to use something that doesn't leave a mark on the fabric that I don't have to wash out or, you know, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be cleaned. So, um, yeah. you know, this one, this kind of goes along the theme of things that are too hard to hoop because there are things that are just too hard to hoop or, or, harder to hoop and right. denim jackets definitely could fit into mm -hmm. that category because of of the seams yeah, so and this we is, always want to get in those tiny little areas like the yoke you know front or back you know absolutely we, and look, pockets. we want to maximize that space you know right. we don't want to sew some little teeny thing on a you know it's we want we want eye catching and striking yeah so this uh jacket has been on the tv show it's been on it's so easy but it also started out started its life <laughs> as a project uh in in the pages of dime yeah and i um, remember it was stunning just stunning for that you know planning what i did is i tried to figure out okay what hoop is going to work the best for me so oh, i'm trying to get this to advance to the next screen and it's not going Oh yeah, we sometimes have that. Um, so maybe we'll just pull you and I up. And you know, sometimes the technology, like, kind of a little bit lags of a, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sure it'll let her, it'll let her advance it'll, to the next. It'll slot. Probably refresh. Right. You know, it's interesting. Deborah Morgan said that she bought a Foff machine because Nancy Zeman was using Foff in the '80s. So Deborah, I'm interested to know: Do you do you still stitch on a Foff, or have you um, changed machines since the '80s? Because wow, boy, hasn't all of that changed? You know, all of the machine features and so forth since the '80s. Definitely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Right. I don't see. I don't see that screen going see forward, Eileen. Okay, so now no. just share again. Mm -hmm. Yep, just share again, and it'll happen. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's just do that. Okay, here Alta. This our friend Alta is actually in South Africa, and so maybe we'll just leave this up on screen while uh, Joanne is uh, trying to resurrect her PowerPoint. But so she. Has been embroidered for a while after both of her machines, you know, punk, punked out on her. And uh, so any advice on uh, getting a new machine, how to restart all this when she plans to retire in October? Well, first off, congratulations on retiring in October. Yeah. That's really exciting, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And, um, so how do you get confident again to start embroidery as you need to plan? Well, you know, just like when you started in the very beginning, Alta, start basic. Start with towels, terry cloth towels, put monograms on towels, uh, you know, simple things like that that aren't overly complicated. And then you will build your confidence back up and then, you know, move on to garments like, you know, a sweatshirt or a t-shirt or something easy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, another thing I learned from you and I, you know, when I, I've said this to you before, but there are so many things I've learned from you. Um, Keep that, whatever that item is that maybe, you know, has a, some spots on it or whatever, that t-shirt that you don't wear anymore mm -hmm. and use that for your practice. Right. And just keep embroidering on it. Like just embroider all over it. Each time you want to test something, um, it'll, it'll get you going. I think it's like anything you have to take that first step. And once you yeah. get going, you're going to find it's probably hard to stop. Right. <laughs> because okay. Like riding a bike, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we're back back to, you know, that that jacket. And I used a few different um, hoops and I used a few different techniques. I'm a big believer in having as many hoops as you could possibly <laughs> gather of different types. You know, certainly the hoops that come with your machine, the um, optional hoops that you can buy. If you have it, you will you will use it. But things like um, your pal tool is another uh I know you've shown it many times here on your show. It's another 
fabulous way to be able to uh, perfectly place and plan again where you're going to stitch that. And again, um, be able to do all that without making a bunch of ugly marks on your fabric that all have to come out. So in this case, I just used instead of one target sticker, I used three of the, um, the dime target stickers and lined everything up um, with that pail so that I would know that my entire motif that I was stitching on that back yoke would be perfectly, perfectly centered. Now, maybe one sticker would have been enough, but I like to err on the side of safe. You know, it's just that little bit of, of you know, tilt could show up. So by making your lines longer rather than shorter, it'll, it'll give you more, uh, you know, right. more success. Well, I just have to real quick. Alta says that she's stressing that she will need to earn extra income when she retires. And thanks for the feedback. Well, you know, we get that. But also, you know, maybe you could earn some income with your embroidery machine. So that's another whole aspect, isn't yeah, it? Definitely. A whole other topic that we don't have time for here today. But so there again, you know, I had to plan how was I going to hoop that jacket. So I planned for this large area to use uh, sticky paper. And I know you've you know, this was before the day when you came out with those great hoops that are geared specifically for that. So again, that's a, you know, that's a great add on to yeah. what you already have is those wonderful um, new sticky hoops. So sticky hoop and sticky paper can save the day. Absolutely. But again, there are times when you're doing a smaller area. And for that particular job, what I did for the front yokes is I used my, uh, my five by seven, might have, actually it might've been my four by four, my four by four, dime magnetic hoop. And the reason I love using it for an area like this is because it just lays right on top of those seams. Cause that's, what's tricky about denim jackets. That's probably the trickiest thing is, is maneuvering around those seams. Well, the magnetic hoop has no problem laying flat on top of those seams. And then I brought up the, the grid with the camera and just, you know, again, kind of tweaked it a little bit to make sure everything's level. But, um, it, I, I also love the fact that those hoops are perfectly square on the inside. So if you are lining it up with a seam or an edge, you know, you can just visually do it or you can measure even using simple measuring tools and get that all straight. So again, there's a hoop, there's a hoop for every task, right? That's right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So the other um, thing I like to do is, is work with offsite embroidery. So that's another way of, dealing with areas that would be hard to hoop. If it's hard to hoop, embroider it off-site and then literally add it on. So lace is a popular thing for that. I know, you know, I just got my lace maker software. Yay! So I'm just getting ready to fire it's that nice. up. Maybe we could do another show with some inspiring, yeah. inspiring lace. But Oh, I can't wait you know, to see what you would do with it. Your work is so beautiful. You're creating appliques. So for this particular case, um, I actually created an applique using a built-in function in the machine that allowed me to take a design that wasn't freestanding lace and add that um, scallop around it. So it's the same thing I did in these two camp, you know, uh, pajama tops here. And of course, this one <laughs> you have made famous by talking about it multiple times. But again, it's just embroidered on netting with an applique outline added to it, trimmed real close, and then placed on the fabric just like any ready-made lace that you would buy and zigzagged in place. So look at it, that beautiful creation. I mean, Joanne, well, I remember when we opened that box. That was just stunning. And Joanne would send it, you know, all wrapped in tissue and folded and pressed and creased, you know, <laughs> just all prepped perfectly. We literally could pull it out and put it on a hanger, maybe steam a little bit here or there. Unlike, you know, other writers would literally just kind of ball it up and put it in a box, knowing that we uh, would have a studio that would prep all the work. And, you know, I was guilty of that too. But what a joy to open that box and see that beautiful garment. It was really wow. You were always so good to give me feedback on it. So that yeah. was always nice to hear. You feel like you're sending a baby, a, a baby in the box. Right, you spent right. all that time on it. You yeah. know, you, you Our want to friend sure. also says she wouldn't want to sleep in it. Would love to wear that and, and get so many compliments. Yeah, I have, I might as well wear it to the grocery store. <laughs> but I have slept in that many times. And one of my most fun stories with this is I was doing a retreat where we were in a hotel and we were staying up all night sewing. So I went ahead, went to my room, changed into my 
sat in PJs and came back because I was presentable enough yeah. to be in front of mixed company, but still had my still had my PJs on. So Wonderful. I've definitely definitely worn those. They're they're very comfortable. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to interrupt again because, you know, Wendy Hansen said that she started on a Viking Rose 20 years ago, and today she has the FOF Creative Sensation. But she's been able to upgrade by buying used machines from a dealer. Yes. And she saved quite a bit of money like that. And you That know, is yeah. so smart. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like a car. It's smarter to buy a used car if it has 10,000 miles on it. You're going to save five, 10 grand, whatever it is, depending on the model. Yeah. And, you know, today they're dealer certified, just like the machines are, often come with a warranty. So that's something to consider if you want to move up. And, you know, maybe you can't afford the brand new top of the line, but somebody else is moving on and trading yeah. up. Pre pre owned and pre loved by somebody else. Yeah, and you know, so. so many of us have a personal relationship with our sewing machine dealer. You know that you really could call them up and say, "Hey, I really want that new double X Z twenty four. Oh yeah, but I can't afford it. So when you get your first trade in, will you call me first and get on that? Yeah, I have a that. I have a friend right now who's doing yeah. exactly that. She knows what she wants and she's willing to wait for it. And as soon as yeah. that one comes in, she's going to be first on mm -hmm. the list to grab it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So that whole idea, though, of offsite embroidery is is to give you, you know, the 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 idea and the inspiration that you can, you know, create it separately in the hoop and then add it on. And it doesn't have to be a lace design. In fact, it doesn't even have to be applique, because when you do this, you're keeping the whole garment very soft as well mm -hmm. because you're not adding it directly to the fabric. So the dress on the left, that was another another dime article, and I simply stitched the embroidery and then trimmed close to it. Um, I, I made it, you know, just a perfectly even trim around there and applique that on using a thread that matched the fabric and you can't tell, it just melts, melts right in. The primary reason I did that in that particular case was because what we were talking about before, you never really know what some, something's gonna look like until you try it on. And a wrap style garment can be a little tricky to get embroidery placement because until you put it on you know, the body that's going to wear it, you don't necessarily see where that's going to fall. So I was able to audition. Case, in that case, it needs to be complete. Like you can't really audition that in pattern pieces, you know, with all that excess. Yeah, you know. Exactly. That was done as a final, final thing. Now, the other dress then just goes to show you that, again, it doesn't, it can be any design. Yeah. Many designs, let's say many, many designs can work with this. So sure. They just, just need to have be fairly closed. They exactly. Can't be really open where you're not able to attach anything. So Cindy Ball wants to know, uh, we do share tips on attaching these types of appliques, uh, like stitch settings, needle size, thread, that kind of sure, thing. Sure, sure. It's a great question. Um, I sometimes I'll use monofilament thread for for um, attaching it with a zigzag. Mm -hmm. Most times, though, I try to match either the the prominent color in the motif or the the color of the actual garment that I'm that I'm putting it on. I really prefer to use standard thread or even embroidery thread mm -hmm. rather than the monofilament. Sometimes monofilament, even the good monofilaments, can can feel a little scratchy against your skin yeah um, and they stretch and frankly they're hard to see <laughs> yeah so regular thread really is my my preference i'll pick whatever needle is appropriate for the fabric so if i'm doing in a knit then i'll i'll use a, a stretch mm -hmm. needle and yeah. did she have one other question to that yeah candy gray um, wants to know is freestanding lace too thick to use as an applique so what we teach here is um, our freestanding lace is not too thick to treat as an applique. It's all about the rinsing, uh, rinsing away of the water soluble stabilizer. So the warmer the temperature of the water that you use to rinse away the stabilizer, the softer the embroidery, embroidered lace will be once it's dried. Yes. And that makes it very fluid and beautiful on a garment. Now, if you don't use warm or hot water, you use cold water, that's going to give you freestanding lace that literally will stand up, which is desirable in some cases, but maybe not in this technique. Or you would leave that in there, sew it on, because it's a heck of a lot easier to right. stiff that's, lace. That's what I was thinking. Fabric. And then, uh, and then just rinse the whole thing in hot or warm water, and then it's really great. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Like I yep. said, that's a topic for another whole day. So hopefully we'll do a, yeah. we'll do a future and we can, we can talk about yeah. more. And more so lakes. a couple other questions, Cheryl um, Massanini, Mancini maybe wants to know, is it poly or nylon monofilament? Um, I always stick with poly monofilament personally. Yeah. It's usually a little bit softer and a little bit, a um, little bit finer. So, right. And then are you and, stitching on, go ahead. Yeah. Let me back up. Cause yeah, maybe I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't know you could read all this. <laughs> I could read some of it. Um, let me yeah. just back up and just show that um, who, well, let's see. I think it was, I think it was there. Yeah. There I think go. that's where I was when we, when we, yes. um, I, per, my personal method is I try to find um, a tool, bridal tool, which you could find it in a million colors in a color that matches my base fabric. So that was mm-hmm. an aqua knit dress. It was slinky knit. Um, which is a very, you know, popular, that kind of that travel knit slinky yep. style. It's very stretchy and I have never had very much success embroidering on it. Me neither. So that's why I chose the, the offsite yeah. method. So I bought netting in an aqua color, very fine netting. I hoop two layers of netting with one layer of water soluble fibrous stabilizer on the bottom and one layer on top. So essentially I'm making a sandwich and the water soluble mesh stabilizer is my bread and the two layers of the fine netting um is my bologna (laughs) in the middle love that yep and then another um tip for you on that anytime you're hooping for um creating lace like this or freestanding designs make sure that your water soluble is really snug and firm in the hoop if you don't have it really nice and tight in there, um, the the movement that's created um, can cause your designs to uh, not link up perfectly, and that's what causes them to separate. So you want that very, very smooth and very, very tight. And then when you're done, like I said, you just uh, trim around it. I leave a little bit of netting as a margin, and um, that's what I use then to zigzag, you know, to catch for for my zigzag. I use an open toe foot a clear open toe foot because that gives you full visibility. And I will very often put another piece of stabilizer. I think when I did this show, I think you'll actually see me do that. I took another piece of stabilizer and put it all inside that neckline area so that when I was doing the zigzagging, um, it had even more to bite into. And then I could trim that away and, um, you know, and wash out the excess. I also used a washable, um, fabric glue to glue those motifs in place oh. rather than pinning them. Sometimes I'll pin, yeah. but um, sometimes, you know, too many pins can get in your way. So sure. And I drop my feed dogs. I free motion. Quote. Oh, you're good. You're yeah. good. I just find it's easier. I don't have, yeah. uh, I'm not fighting the fabric. I can just do it. And it, you know, that thread, if it matches your embroidery, it blends beautifully. You won't Nobody see it. it. I mean, somebody would have to get their nose up to that in order to notice it. And if they're doing that, they're getting way too close, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. They're not really there to yeah. admire your embroidery, truth it, be told. And it just melts right in, which is really nice. It just, yeah. you know, that it's just, it's a, I love doing it that way because it's, right. it's a fun way to play with it. And I think too, a lot of times when, when you do as much embroidery as we do, you, you, you do it so much and you love it, right? I love it. You love it. But it's kind of fun to work in modules. So you can go to bed that night and say, Oh, I got, I got six roses done. I only got two more to go tomorrow. And then the next day, Oh, I got three roses stitched on or glued in place. And then the next time, the next time, you know, I like to, I like to do all my embroidery, like for this technique, I would do all those roses. I might have one or two machines running or, you know, just programming the machine over and over uh, to get that abundance of roses. And then I just want to sit down and and apply it all at one time, you know, that's how I like to work. Yeah. And, you know, in fact, that's a great point because it's another way that you're accomplishing more in less time because you can fill the hoop, Mm -hmm. create all those motifs. If you were linking those designs together, you'd have a lot more time involved in that. So it's right. just another, another way to do it. Again, another the more you know, do. the more you sew, right? Yeah. The more you know, the more you sew. My friend Amy Bachman uh, is, oh, I love is that. Yeah, always repeating that. Oh, yeah, she's great. That's uh, a, a, 
a very popular dealer in the Pittsburgh area in yes. Cranberry. Is it Cranberry? Uh, she's area? she's in the Cranberry area. She just yeah. recently moved into a new larger location, oh, uh, just a her. little distance away. So yeah. yeah. So if you're looking for a brother machine, she'd be your girl. <laughs> One of your girls, right? Okay. So where were we? So we just have a couple. I think just a couple more. Good. If this cooperates. Oh yeah. If it cooperates, I'm trying to make it cooperate, yeah. but I'm not so sure it is. Not so sure. Not so sure. Mm -hmm. It wants to think for a little bit. Okay. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, I could share, you know what I forgot to do, Joanne? I forgot hmm. to show the small town charms. Are, oh are my. Oh, so we need to see those. So why don't we do that? And then uh, when we, after we take a look at them, we'll move on back to Joanne's slides and then we'll look at Sticky Hoop. So. As you know, these designs are free on the Dime website all year long. And right now in February, we have the Sweet Shop. And so this one was made by Chris Yost. Look how great this is. So oh my. if you're new, you know, she's added the pet, uh, the pet bowl in the front and the dog and the cat and the little bird on the roof. What fun fabrics, huh, Joanne? Oh, fabulous. Beautiful yeah. colors. I Beautiful know. colors. So inviting. And that yummy wallpaper. colors. They're yummy. They are yummy. And that wallpaper inside the shop, love that. Love that. Okay, and then we have Donna Branton. She's got DJ Sweets here. She, I, I like her uh, sidewalk fabric. Kind of looks like a boardwalk maybe, you know? Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Very nice, very well done. And then Jackie Burke, oh, this is stunning. Just stunning, sweet street, sweet shop. Say that fast. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, I love the colors in that one too. That yeah, blue, and blue Wendy so Hansen sweet. says great awning fabric. And that awning fabric is to die for. It's really well done. But also notice, you know, the small scale of that floral fabric that she chose for the shop itself. Very, it's perfect. And then she has embroidered hearts all over the window and door. So cute. And she put an address, 221. I think uh -huh. that's the first one that I've seen an address in that little spot, which is just perfect. So cute. And then Jane <laughs> Morris. Wow, she really went to town. So she added the name Bakery up on the second story. Oh, my. And I think what she did here, she used the 7 by 12 design for the first floor and then added the five by seven second floor for the second story for the top of the bakery, which, you know, lots of buildings are like that, right? Wider um, first floor and a, a narrower second floor. But yeah, are embroidered goodies. Wouldn't it be fun to live in that second story and smell that bakery yeah. stuff <laughs> all the time? Might be a little dangerous for me. I, you know, have a little bit of a sweet tooth. Look, she's got, you know, ice cream cones. Oh, maybe they're, I don't know, some kind of cones and little cakes and rolled things. Oh, that's precious. It, it Just, looks like she might have used um, some uh, batting behind that too to give that a little extra dimension, dimension on the absolutely. on the door and the windows. Yeah, and if you could see the glistening on the window, so I imagine she used vinyl to uh, mm. make it really appear like glass. And now look at Joy Seidel. Oh my! Yeah. It's oh just, my! Yeah, they're charming. They're, they're so charming. Talk about she, small town charm. She found the perfect fabric to match with that. Yeah. She sure did. They're adorable. And then a Judy Lingle Mervitz did bake a cake. Super fun. Cute. Big <laughs> address on the, on the awning. Lovely. Aunt Lottie's Lottie Conrad. Hey, Lottie. Lottie. Good Hi. for you. Yeah. And this is her quilt shop. For, that was our January small town charm. And then she also did February's. So I Just thought I would share both. Really. Nice. Sweet, huh? Nice. Yeah. And then Luann Mack and Green Greenberg, she also did the January quilt shop. She called it the Diva Den. She said that's what her husband calls her sewing room. I thought that was super <laughs> cute. Yeah. And then here's Marjorie Hirschberger, who also is watching, watching today. Now look at her windows on the second story. She's got flower pots up oh there. Oh, my. She Attention little, to detail. Attention yeah. to detail. She's got a pooch in the foreground and then a whisk and beater on the front door. Perfect fabric for her sidewalk, too. Yeah. I know. Really great. Patricia Page, look at that. 
look at that wedding cake. Now she didn't use my wimpy wedding cake. She really <laughs> liked the town and she added those little mice. She said, no, no, I wouldn't think that's really what you would want around a bakery, but they were so cute and kind of Valentine with the hearts and so forth. She couldn't resist. That's sweet. Yeah. yeah. And she had a potted plant in the foreground. Uh, really very lovely made with love. And then Sandra Sparks. Now she nested hers right into a pattern fabric that is kind of a landscape. Uh huh. Clever, clever. Yeah, very clever. Very clever. And Candy Bray. Now this detail that. on Candy Bray. I, I really take a look at that. The fabric that she used for the wall, you know, the outside wall, it, mm -hmm. it's just. You know, it's, I don't know that I would have selected it, but it really works here. And then yeah. she redigitized the windows up on the second story. She added some kind of lace filigree curtains and she, she extended the windows. Yeah, really very well done. She and put then, a lot of effort into that. She did put a lot of effort. And in fact, she also did um, a, a whole different one. And this is for a family member, I believe. But let's take a close up look of her first floor of the second one. So all of this is customized for her style. That's what she did. Yeah. Very, nice. very nice. Yeah. Very, very nice. Very fun. Ah, sticky. That's just what we were talking about today, wasn't it? You got to have that sticky. Why don't we take a look at sticky? Then we'll go back to your slides. Can we sure. Do that? Yeah. Okay. So these are the new sizes that we have. We have um, we have the Foff and Viking 120 by 120. And of course it comes with 25 sheets of sticky stabilizer. That's what you see right back here. So compatible with lots of Foff and Viking machines. And then we have the Bernina 145 um, by 25. I'm trying to get that glare off. It's a little challenging. And also that also has the stabilizer on the back, 25 sheets of that peel and stick. And we have the brother five by seven for machines that are, you know, like the uh, dream creator, the Innovus 15,000, 25,000 and so forth. So that's oh, such a handy size. It really is that five yeah. by seven. That might be the wrong compatibility chart on that. We'll see. But anyway, and we've had a lot of people ask for a brother four by four. Yeah. So we have that now. And of course, our Janome users. And these are the Janome machines that are the 500 and 550E. So I'm just going to give you like a peek into that attachment. You can see there's that white attachment that goes on the Janome machines. And of course, it also, all these hoops come with the 25 sheets of the peel and stick. It's a flat hoop. It is recognized by your machine and you apply that peel and stick to the back of the hoop. Those uh, peel and stick paper sheets are all cut to fit these individual hoops. So I think you'll find that really, really handy. Well, your, your um, peel and stick paper too is very, it's a very special adhesive. It's, um, it's, it's, it's the kind of adhesive that your machine will be happy with. <laughs> right. And so Alta wants to know, is it reusable? Absolutely. So you would just continue to apply the sticky stabilizer to the wrong side. Here, here's the right side. I have a sheet on here and you know, it's sticky, right? But on the back side, this is how I've applied it. So I've put it right on the back of my hoop. And then after I, uh, use the embroidery, I can just peel this off the back and it does leave some residue on the hoop, but that's fine. You'll just put another piece right over it. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And if people want to know, is there a right way to get the adhesive off the hoop? Um, you can use a product like uh, Goo Gone to, to remove it, but you know, frankly, I wouldn't really sweat it out. It's the back of the hoop. Let's see. It's the back of the hoop. Victoria Bartle. She says she has the five by seven, um, mag uh, monster hoop. Well, what, okay. So if you have the five by seven sticky hoop and you want to know what other size we, we also make the, uh, six by 10 and the four by four for brother. So either of those in the sticky. And of course, if you are talking about a snap hoop, monster hoop with the, you know, the whole magnetic hoop, then we have a lot of different sizes for uh, a lot of machines. So you would really have to, 
you know, you have to look at your activities and decide what hoop do you go to 50, 60% of the time? Are you using a four by four? Do you do a lot of small work? Are you doing quilts and you're using a really big hoop? Then that would be the right monster hoop for you to buy. On sticky hoops, a six by 10, if, if you're a brother or baby lock user, a six by 10 provides a larger platform for a uh, embroiderable to sit on. For instance, if you're gonna do slippers, it's nice to have a large area for the whole sole to sit on while you do that flap. But you know, if you're doing a lot of children's wear and all your designs are small, then a four by four might work for you. Yeah, right. and collect them, you know, collect one and then keep yes. adding to your list because uh, you can never have too many hoops. I mean, I, I, I'm, I say that in all seriousness, if you have that, when it's time to do a task, you're gonna reach for the one that's more appropriate than for that job or to make it make it easier. Right. Yeah. So Judy Whitaker, she wants to know that she uh, assumes FAF users use the Viking. I said Viking, but on the label, it says Viking FAF. So because they are um, the same compatibility. So sorry about that. I misspoke. Yeah. So aren't they fun? They're so fun. fun. They're, they're great. They're great. Yeah. That, that's okay. Like so show me what else you have. Okay. So I just have a few more. So just um, yeah. another one here again oh. is... Um, off-site embroidery and on-site. Um, down by the, the lower area by the hip, I was able to take apart the lining and embroider directly on the jacket, but there was no way I was gonna get embroidery on those lapels. They were very narrow and you know you don't wanna see from the other side. So again, I just used the same technique with a tool and uh, you can't see it. It zigzagged on, I, I have a whole strip you know that, that um, matches the size of the lapel and I just zigzagged it on and it melts right into it. Now with this one, I just want to um, give you a, an, again, another little tip because it's all in the details, right? You would assume that yellow netting would have been the perfect choice. Well, I took the jacket with me to the fabric store and I auditioned various colors of netting and I found that uh, a crew actually blended in better than, than the, the pale yellow did. So that's what I went with and it, you couldn't see it at all when it was done. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to take, take what you need to the fabric store while you're shopping and find the right thing. Oh, this sure just, it likes to, likes to freeze up today for some reason. <laughs> like that screen, but I don't know about, about the next one. Let's see. Nope. I don't think so, Eileen. This isn't going to go without, um, without, without waiting. <laughs> okay. Well, and I really had only a few more pictures. Um, there's, you know, the, the last technique that I wanted to talk about was using uh, your embroidery in sections. So I've, you know, I've done a lot of that um, where I've created in some of the wraps in my book are like that, where I embroidered on a section of fabric and then added additional sections or took a, a large section and then added a uh, ribbon in between so that the designs look like they were all, you know, linked together, but it's really the ribbon trim that is tying those designs together and making it look like a, like, like a border. And it also gives you the opportunity to tie color schemes together when you have that, that kind of option. Um, I can actually, um, I probably could show one piece on, on my camera here. Okay. So this is an oh, example of exactly that. that where I yeah. just did, um, you know, embroidery on a piece of piece of silk and then added silk ribbon, just zigzagged on. I used my my braiding foot for that so that, um, you know, match the color scheme, tie it together and you have something really, really upscale. I did the same thing on, on this one here, again, oh. embroidered in and on blocks of fabric. And then I embroidered, uh, you know, multiple blocks and then added that ribbon so that it's covering the raw edges of those pieces of fabric. And you're, you've got, uh, again, a nice color scheme. It's also keeps it light and soft. So when you're, you're wearing this, you don't have that, that, um, you know, that, uh, stiff, stiff look that you would have if you're sometimes embroidering right on, on an item. So it keeps it nice and soft and, and flowing. So that, you know, we could probably, we could probably end with that. Um, if, you know, if you want to, it's just uh, okay. other, other ways of doing things. And, and, you know, hopefully what, 
I've inspired a few people at least to try some different techniques and see some different ways to achieve that uh, perfection that you can get with with placement and you know doing it in various different ways and you know uh, tying those color schemes together with some extra little trims and things. And, well, your work is just beautiful. Jan O'Malley says, um, stunning, plus you so beautifully with everything nice and straight. Yes, she always does do that for sure. You know, I, we had a, um, I know that you inspire people all the time. And so I'm always interested to see how inspiration can uh, spark creativity in other people. And I have a great example of uh, one of our viewers who shared this with our customer service team that this is a, a photograph of her son's home and she digitized the house using our small town charms, you know, making a lot of changes. And so she gave that to him for Christmas. So isn't uh, that adorable? That is so amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just can't wait to see what people will do with the work that you have shown here today. You know, who knows how they'll be inspired. And, you know, we do have a great offer on your book, which is, you know, wrapped in embroidery. And um, this is you can get this in, over a dime. Just I have a couple more pictures, actually, that I think are, if it behaves, we could show that oh, uh, good. show some yeah. some wraps that I actually did on the TV show, you know, some yeah. of them that are that are in the book, oh, scarves, beautiful. wraps. Um, yeah. I've even made some without embroidery. So, you know, <laughs> you can do that if you want to. Once you have the, the pattern and the patterns are, are all in the book, um, they're all based on measurements. So you don't need any paper pattern. You could draw it right on your fabric or use tracing cloth. So the 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 one in the corner there from show 1909-1 that is um, the suede one that's um, I've got here behind me, but I did it in a plain ordinary sweater knit too. I did a black one and a white one. So, you know, you get multi-use out of, out of these things. Right. Um, I've, I've done um, sheer, a sheer wrap again, using the exact same pattern that I would use to make my embroidered wrap, same shape, but instead of doing it on fabric that's embroidered, I just, um, cut it out of chiffon and hemmed the edges and created a, a nice, a nice wrap from that. So that's Beautiful. another one from, from the show. So there again, there's, you know, be decked with ribbons. So it's just an easy way to, to do that um, and get that look with, uh, you know, with the sections of fabric, you can use silk dupioni if you want to in the book, I have a little recipe that tells you how, how I wash mine, but you can also use uh, crepe back satin, the, uh, scarf in the middle, the pashmina in the middle is done just on polyester crepe back satin. And it's a great substitute for silk. And it's, you know, very easy to care for. And the contrast between that and the kind of matte Pashima is lovely. Exactly. Really lovely. Yeah. That, very nice. Yeah. So there you see how I did it. Just, you know, embroidered in sections, layered over the raw edges with, with ribbon. And then I used a, an edge joining foot to top stitch that in place. So, you know, Jan gave me that wonderful compliment and I appreciate it, but I have to say, truth be told, um, I'm, I'm reaching for a special accessory very often. I'm not eyeballing it, you know, right. and having an edge guide foot allows you to, you know, your eye goes along where the edge is following the ribbon and the needle follows. So you That's don't right. have to be as perfect when, when you use those tools. I love to write about, about feet. I do um, uh, four blogs a month um, for brother on their blog. And then I also blog on my own uh, website. And I'm always um, working in accessories and tutorials and even ordinary presser feet, you know, something like a, you know, like a, a buttonhole foot and showing you kind of all the ins and outs and, and how to use it. So it's good Wonderful. to learn to learn to use those tools. So yes, I love wraps. Yes, I love scarves. Yes, I love embroidery. And I like to marry it all together and create something really special. Yeah. So I hope that I hope that you will too. Well, I have to give you a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. You did a really lovely job and you always inspire all of us. So thank you so much, Joanne, for your time today. And thank all of you for watching and spending uh, an hour or so with us. It was really a pleasure. It's been a joy. It's been a joy. Thanks for having me and happy sewing, everybody. Happy sewing.